Hello, Dr. Dyke Drummond here at the home of TheHappyMD.com in beautiful Seattle, Washington. Welcome to the latest episode of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. Tools so you can recognize and prevent your own burnout. Stories of burnout put to its highest and best use and wellness leadership strategies. Everything you need to be a physician on purpose. Hello again, Dr. Dyke Drummond here at the home of the Happy MD in beautiful Seattle, Washington, with the latest Physicians on Purpose podcast. And I'm really excited today because I get to share with you an alternate universe for the primary care doctors of the United States of America, because I have with me two gentlemen physicians from Chen Med, that's C-H-E-N-M-E-D. Chen is a name, the Chen family, Chen Med, all one word which is a full risk primary care um, service organization that provides for those of you who work in a fee-for-service system, an alternate universe of both patient and provider experience. And I've got Dr. Fassel Syed and Dr. Dan McCarter with me today. Both of them are in the leadership team of ChenMed. And what I wanna do is have a conversation about how powerfully The business model and revenue model of the organization you work for affects the care you give your patients and your experience on the job. So, Fassel, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about your position in the organization and where you started and how you got to ChenMed and all that good stuff. Uh, Well, uh, it's good to be here. I'm Fassel Syed. I'm the National Director of Primary Care for ChenMed. I got into medicine to help people. Uh, from the very beginning, when I was, especially as an intern, I remember uh, feeling the sacredness of the doctor-patient relationship. So the doctor-patient relationship, above all else, was was most sacred to me. And uh, I remember, even especially as an intern, I was really bothered by all the waste I saw happening in the hospitals and just the business nature of healthcare. I re- there's a story I remember with uh, with an emergency room doctor, and I saw an administrator him not being grilled, but it was he was like being it was like he was being grilled. He was the the ER doctor who would see all the extreme trauma and all the the wild things in the emergency room, and mean, meanwhile he was being grilled for not seeing enough patients in his shift. And we all knew him as just this amazing doctor. And meanwhile, there was another doctor who was doing the fast track you know, flying through 30, 35, 40 patients in a shift. And we're thinking, oh my God, you know, his value is not appreciated. Right. And it just got, and it continued on from there, you know, throughout residency. And uh, so after I did my residency at an unopposed family medicine, uh, residency training program in Columbus, Georgia. And uh, after I completed my residency, I, I started my career at a large FQHC in Tampa, Florida. Um, at the time, Tampa's uh, in Hill, Hillsborough County, Hillsborough County had some of the worst maternal mortality rates in the country. And I just couldn't believe that, you know, it had maternal mortality rates worse than even third world countries, just just from not having basic access. I mean, we were just talking like just somebody to put the hand on a belly type of access. I mean, really, it was unbelievable to me. And so I started my career there. Uh, and at that time, my mind was really focused on increasing access. We've got to increase access. How can it be that there are 30 million Americans who don't have health insurance. Like, how is that possible? And in the FQHC space, uh, they have funding, there's funding through HRSA, there's grant money to that even if you don't have health insurance, you can be seen uh, regardless of your ability to pay. And I thought that was just beautiful until I got into that space and, um, and, and realized that, you know, patients... We're only being seen maybe once a year, twice a year. We're not even averaging two visits per patient per year. And uh, I remember that was just incredibly, was incredibly frustrating for me. So anyways, I started off my career there. And uh, while I was there, I, I remember seeing the Chen Med vans in Tampa in, in some of the worst neighborhoods, underserved. Hang on a second. Hang know. on a second. Vans? What are they, a Van- moving company? Right. You know, transportation, actually providing transportation to patients from underserved neighborhoods to the health center. 
and uh, for socials, social activities. There was food, karaoke, Bible study. I mean, it was something unlike I've ever, and, and nobody, nobody in the city knew anything about this company. So let me, just, let me just pause you for just <laughs> yeah. a second, because what we're beginning to see is a different way of operating that is, again, the root of it is the revenue model of the business. So right. let's talk just a little bit about your drive to serve underserved people, your drive to make a difference to maternal mortality rates in Hillsborough County, and the pervasive um, uh, payment mechanism, which is FQHC, which provides a premium for fee for service. Yes. So you're only paid when you see a patient. Who gets to decide when you see a patient? The patient gets to decide when they're sick enough to come in, and they don't know because they're an underserved population to begin with. So yes. you, sa you said, and I think you've told me that that was the second largest FQHC in the state of Florida before, Yeah. that on average, you saw your patients about twice a year. Yeah, like 1.7, 1 1.8 visits per patient per year. Now, and, you get uh, paid a little bit more for that, right? At, yes. At each visit. But we'll all agree that in an underserved population where what you're dealing with is high maternal mortality, you would like to see them more frequently than that. Of course. You're, you're frustrated and you're watching 10 med vans going back and forth across the street. What in is the going on over there? Yeah, in the neighborhoods where, you know, I would beg doctors. I would say, please, can you just come help me one day a month? You know, just come one day, please. You know, and then here, like, this is like this wonderful, over the top, like a, a concierge level in a place where there was little to no access. With the same uh, patients. Same patient populations. It wasn't like uh, they were trucking rich people no. around. <laughs> From some of the most dangerous neighborhoods, actually, you know, and... um and and nobody knew who they were. Um, and then I found out from my community social workers that, yeah, you know, this is a concierge clinic focused on the poor, the sick, and the elderly. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And so this was around July. It was <laughs> mind-blowing. We were busy going 100 miles an hour in life. And um, a month later, I ran, I saw the, the Chen Med booth at the Florida Academy of family physicians meeting, their summer meeting. And that's the first interaction I had with uh, Chen Med at the time. And uh, and again, you remember, I was focused with taking care of most, you know, not mostly, but a big chunk of our patients didn't have health insurance. So the recruiters talking with me about Chen Med, everything sounds amazing and wonderful. And so my question was to her, I said, well, what do you do with the people who don't have insurance? And she said, oh no, all our patients have health insurance. And immediately I turned away, I said, oh, you're just another one of those money making operators. That's, you know. and I walked away from her, and she started yelling. She said, "I said, I said, no, all our patients have are their Medicare. They're seniors. We focus on seniors. So with through Medicare, there's a Medicare Advantage program, and I can get you connected with someone who can explain to you the whole model. And before I knew it, I had um, some amazing conversations uh, with some of the senior uh, physician leaders at Chen Men. It was just I, I remember um, I remember going back to my my leadership at the health center saying, guys, you know, this is a great, this would be a great place to buy. We should buy them. <laughs> they, they, they're small, there's a small operation. They at the time, like they didn't maybe they had 30, 40,000 patients. And I said, this would be a great, you know, we should we should buy them, we should take this over. <laughs> and and the thought was, well, you know, this managed care from the 80s, and we've seen this come and go, value-based care. I mean, you know, it's it's never gonna work. You know, this is all just, you know, this it's flash, it'll come and it'll pass. And and I didn't feel that way. I really felt like, wow, this is if we can do this with with some of the most medically complex, underserved people living on extremely limited incomes, talking five hundred dollars a month, seven hundred. You know, I know the average Social Security, you know, is fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred, whatever, whatever that number is. But, but, but with patients living in even more limited fixed incomes than that, oh my God! Just imagine the implications for so many more people across the country. That was my biggest concern with the FQHC space. So you got thirty million Americans are getting their medical care through an FQHC. And one to two visits per patient per year makes sense with people. The average patient age in America, average person's age in America is 37, 38 years old. That makes sense. One, two visits a year makes sense for your typical 37, 38 year old. Um, but when you have 10 million out of the 30 million 
people getting their medical care from an FQHC being over the age of 65. You know, I worry a third of the patients who go to an FQHC right now over the age of 65 out of 45 million Americans. So about a quarter of Americans are getting their medical care. Seniors, American seniors getting the medical care from a community health center. And where's the incentive for them to have multiple visits when the reimbursement system is built, like you said, on the fee for service chassis. And, um, and then the funding from the federal funding is based on lives served. So as long as you touch them once, you get credit for the lives served, for, you know. Mm. Um, and, uh, and it just, it wasn't just only about access at that point. I realized, you know, what good is access if it's not effective? Um, so I, I, um, I was very excited to leave from the FQHC space and still, I still feel like a community doctor. Mm -hmm. I still very much so feel like a community. I think I'm always going to identify myself as being a community doctor, focus on underserved people. I'm just focused on underserved seniors now and um so i joined chen med as a primary care doctor and i wanted to live through live i wanted to know what it felt like because i knew it was hard work i knew it was hard work sounds wonderful have a small patient panel see patients frequently don't worry about billing uh, but it's hard work to influence and inspire the team we can get into that with uh, well, some let's of the talk, major mindset shifts let's talk about the mindset shifts and everything but dr dan i want to hear about your journey because uh, from a rural family doc to working with chenman tell us your story about how you came into contact first contact and beyond <laughs> yeah well and, and thanks Ty. yeah i mean it's interesting so not only was i a rural doctor i worked at a, at a, the University of Virginia. Uh, I, I started a rural practice for the University of Virginia um, at, right out of residency in 1990. And so I did the first round of managed care. Um, and it was interesting um, during that time frame at the, at the Department of Family Medicine, we decided we didn't want to be a gatekeeper. We didn't want to argue with patients. All we would do is ask that they come in and talk about the evidence. And we actually did quite well and made good money. Although None of us really understood where the money was coming from. We really sort of had lightning in a bottle. And I was always interested in different practice models. So later I wound up being vice chair of the department and then the associate chief medical officer for all the outpatient clinics at UVA. And in 2011, there was this interesting group that was coming into Virginia that was looking for some leaders. And they sent me a something in the mail wanted me to come interview. And I was like, well, I'm really happy at the University of Virginia, but I went down and it, it was, it was, uh, it was the Chen Med coming out of, uh, Gen Care is the brand they operate under in Virginia. And I remember the first day sitting in the waiting room, uh, that I, I was there. Um, it, it was while I was waiting to talk to, uh, uh Craig Tanio who worked for the company at the time, there was, um, uh, the waiting room was full. And I'm like, oh, big whoop. I mean, this looks like the, you know, this looks like the clinic at, up at UVA. Um, and then the driver from the van, you've been talking about the van, came in and said, everybody ready. And I, I looked around and everybody got up in unison and walked out. They'd already been seen. They weren't waiting to be seen. People didn't wait to get seen. They were waiting to get a ride home. And so I thought this was pretty cool. Hang on a second. Ride home? Again, right. <laughs> what are they? A busing company? <laughs> You're right. So, so anyway, I, it was very interesting. But at the time, we had young children, and I didn't feel like it was a good time to move. But it was sort of like an earworm. Um, later in my time at UVA, I, I wound up helping start and lead an ACO. Got interested in population health. Realized that the large academic centers didn't really know what they were doing. And because of the pressure that was coming financially, and, and, and they're going through a lot of pressure, uh, that money was going to dry up and it was going to take resources away from primary care. And I just really, I had that earworm in my head and I got to looking around and sure enough, uh, Chen Med was still hiring doctors. And so I reached back out and said, okay, I, I, I saw it and I went back and tried to make it work for six years. I couldn't do it. So. I'm ready to make the move. So then I moved in 2017. And so, um, yeah. And so it, it, it's pretty cool to get to get to do this and get to not only practice in the model, also help educate our doctors, but also help educate other residents and students about value-based care and, and 
where healthcare, we hope healthcare is going, it has to go if we're going to save primary care. And we're not going to save the U.S. healthcare system without saving primary care. So whether you work for ChenMed or somebody else, you got to figure out how to do the value-based care model and how to, to thrive as a primary care physician. So let's, let's take a second to pull the curtain all the way back. So we've got some clues that something different is going on. Vans taking people back and forth from the <laughs> building, you know, happy people in a waiting room that have already been seen. I mean, we, we have all these telltale clues that something different is going on. So let's reveal the whole model. So the revenue and business model change between fee-for-service, which includes FQHC. FQHC is just subsidized fee-for-service with a little extra money thrown in, right? So fee-for-service versus value-based care capitation whatever words you'd like to use and how the model, the payment model rolls into a completely different way of taking care of patients. Who'd like to take the lead? Well, I can, I can start. And then we, this is something that we talk about a lot and I'm sure Dr. Dan will, will help, will remind me or cut me off when I go, go off on a tangent. <laughs> uh, you know, so ChenMed is like what you, what, what you said, you know, um, with the difference between fee for, so fee for service is the billing model for every interaction with the healthcare delivery system. There's a, a CPT code or a billing code attached to it. Doesn't matter if you're making a phone call or you're doing any interaction. There's a billing code. It's you know attached to it. Now, uh, outside of fee for service, especially value based care, there's there's shared savings value based care, which is a lot of what we see when we hear value based care. There's no downside risk. There's some downside risk value based care. Then all the way at the extreme of value-based care, there's this teeny tiny little world called full risk care. So we operate with, ChenMed operates underneath the full risk umbrella. Actually, there's even a step further than full risk, which is global capitation, where you, where you take on the risk of the medications as well. So we're in that little teeny tiny space. So we take full responsibility for the patient's total cost of care. You know, we like to think of it as Outside is full risk in our world, but I, like we like to feel like at least you know we're fully responsible. So if the quality of the care that we deliver is expensive, that's on us. Or if it's complicated, it's on us. Uh, if the patients don't understand whatever the doctors are saying, then that's on us too. Um, and so our focus is on under medically underserved seniors. So like I said before. We're dealing with the poor, the sick, and the elderly. Uh, the average patient age at Chen Med is over 70 years old. Some market to 72, 74. They have five or more chronic medical conditions. Um, like just to give you a comparison with my community health center, the average patient age at my FQHC was the same as the national average, right, right around 37, 38 at my community health center much younger patient population at the FQHC compared to where I'm at right now, um, and uh, much more medically complex, five or more uh, chronic medical conditions at the same time. We didn't see that level of medical complexity at the community health center. So same neighborhoods as the FQHCs, same population, but the segment of the population at FQHC, the seniors, so medically underserved seniors. Um, most of our patients live on limited fixed incomes. Uh, many, many actually did not even have access to care um, because, you know, the fee-for-service world didn't view those neighborhoods or the people who live in those neighborhoods as being profitable. Right. You know, that, that was a fact. Um, and, uh, and so Chen Med operates in those neighborhoods where many of them didn't have any access at all. So it's a complete, I mean, it, we're talking about a different universe, but, but for the people who, who suddenly get access to something like this, it is really unbelievable. A place where you can see the doctor as much as you want, the primary care doctor. There's no co-pays to see the primary care doctor. The doctor routinely sees you on a monthly basis. You know, if we do- So compare hang on a sec, hang on yeah. a second. So- going from two visits a year in an FQHC model to seeing on a monthly basis. So I would, I would 
then I have to assume mathematically that the floor of monthly utilization for your patients is 12, is, is, yeah. excuse me, annual is 12, right? Well, it, it, it's between 10 to 12. Well, no, average yeah, is that's you crazy. Say 10 is a good, 10 is a good number. 10 is and a good, I can get a ride back and forth from the bill. You can, you can give <laughs> me a ride. Oh, we, we, we Uber patients from the emergency room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and hang on, hang on just a second. Let's roll it back to the medical <laughs> because we've still used code words. We've been using risk and yeah. yeah. So, so the reason that you do this is because you, if you don't spend the money, you get to keep what's left of full responsibility, full payment for the healthcare for those people who were insured by the government, right? Medicare and stuff like that, right? So there's right. a bigger pile of money there for their total care. And if you don't spend it all because of inappropriate hospitalizations and things like that, you get to keep some. That's right. Yeah. Well, you get to keep whatever you don't spend. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, when you think about it, so I, 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 every primary care physician, if you're working in the fee-for-service world, you're, every primary care doc fee for service or not is controlling six to ten million dollars in spend a year. That's what's being spent on their patient population. The average is twelve thousand dollars per patient per year. Our patients are a little bit more expensive, uh, probably going up into the fifteen, sixteen thousand dollar mark. But the, the the difference is if we take really good care of the patients and we don't spend the full amount of money, we get to decide how to reinvest that money the following year to take care of more seniors or to offer more services to the seniors we already have. The money is not getting sucked out and being spent in unnecessary emergency room visits and unnecessary hospitalizations. And so that's the, the, the primary care doctors are all are supervising that level of spend. It's just in the fee for service world, you don't generally get the information you need mm. to actually do that or impact that. And so it's, it seems like a lot of visits, right? But if you went to Weight Watchers, they want you to come weigh in once a week, right? And you're only dealing with one problem. And if you're going to AA, they want you to do 90, 90 meetings in 90 days to help you stop drinking. So is it for somebody that's got five medical conditions, is it unrealistic that they come in once a month and get some coaching about uh what to buy at Walmart. I know Fassel loves to, to have that conversation with his patients. <laughs> what I not mean, to buy at Walmart. <laughs> well, no, what to buy at Walmart, to, how to buy riced cauliflower, how to eat healthy at a reasonable cost point and, and make a difference there rather than just giving somebody a prescription for a really expensive drug that they can't afford anyway. Well, and I have this Venn diagram in my head right now where the circles as you speak are, are sliding into more and more position of overlap. One is, one is I'm a doctor because I wanted to help people be healthy, health care. But what we have in fee-for-service is sick care, right? You're only going to come in if you're sick and I'm only going to see you to treat your illness and then you're gone. So <laughs> here all of a sudden... There's a revenue model that pays me for keeping you healthy, which means I can see you more often than only when you think you're sick enough to go to the doctor. And, and also, if I was to walk into a Chen Med facility from the average fee-for-service um, family practice wing, what else would I notice is going on? Yeah, there's buses out front tracking people back and forth, but what else is going on inside the facility? I, I mean, do I have an MA? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what's different? Well, I mean, for starters, I mean, if you just did a compare contrast with uh, life and fee for service, if we just did went through uh, fee for service versus the full risk doctor in the fee for service world, the fee the primary care doctors have panels of between eighteen hundred to twenty five hundred patient panel. That's pretty, that's the average. Although we have met people, we've met some amazing doctors, you know, over the years. And we we, we met doctors with over 6,000 patient panels. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Um, so fee for service, huge panel sizes, fewer visits. Obviously, you only you can only see the people so often. 
within that that world. So they're seeing anywhere between 25 to 34 patients on average on a daily basis. The face-to-face time per patient is about 10 minutes per patient, you know, per, per visit is spent with the face-to-face and that doesn't include all the documentation that's required. I'm just talking just the face-to-face visit time. Um, and uh, it's a very hurried, it's a hurried experience when you're seeing that volume of people. Contrast it with the the full risk world. And in our world, we cap the doctors at 450 patients. The goal at the end of year one is to have 300 patients. Um, Now, things can get crazy. And you may have 300 patients by six months in. But you can imagine, you know, me coming from the community health world. I mean, I had 300 patients by the end of the second week. I mean, I... (laughs) You know, it's such a big difference. And um, and then the visits, the visits, we touched on it. You know, you instead of having two visits per patient per year, you have many, many more. You're talking 10, 12 visits per patient per year, which is a routine. Um, so monthly visits. Um, and, uh, and because you only have, let's say if you have 400 patients, 20 days a month, it's the same people. It's like, this is the first week of the month batch. This is the second week of the month batch. You know, if you have a, pa- a panel of 2,000, 2,500 patients, the typical support staff for a panel of 2,000, 2,500 patients, you, you typically have the doctor, of course. You have a medical assistant, a clinical person, assistant type person. If you're and lucky. Then you'll, if you're lucky. And then you'll have a front desk person, like a, a scheduling person or, you know, so a flow person um, for that panel of 2,000, 2,500 patients. You know, maybe you'll have another person if you're fortunate on top of that. Um, but then you contrast that with, with our world. You know, if the doctors are averaging about 380 patients, you know, per, uh, you know, per, per panel, let's round it to 400. You know, uh, a center with six PCPs, 2,400 patients, will easily have well over 30 people supporting those PCPs on that 2,400 patient panel. Um, so, so I got a guy it, driving a bus. Who else? Oh. Who, else who else is on the? Who, who's oh my god! So then, so that's so that then you have a team. Right. There's an entire team, and that concept of the PCP leading an entire team of people to help, ba- and the team is there. You know, doc, you know, we we you know we like to talk about the. You know, the primary, the language of the tip of the spear, primary care being the tip of the spear. I remember that it was the tip of the spear before I joined ChenMed, and now we're the center of the wheel. Right. right. <laughs> you know, we're the center of the wheel. And uh, so at the center of the wheel is the doctor patient relationship. And so you have all these members of the team who are there to help foster that doctor patient relationship. And when you have that, you know, like you said, you know, the patient, what is it, the patient coming first or the patient first model, whatever, you know, it's gotten, it's one of those things that has, you know, it's a beautiful concept, but it just it's turned into a, a not so good feeling uh, phrase. But what good is the, um, what, you know, what good are we to the patients if we don't take care of our doctors first, right? So, so, so there's the doctor, doctor patient relationship, of course, which is the center of the wheel, but there's a doctor to team relationship you know, which is equally as valuable. And then there's the doctor to doctor relationship, which is another, so there's three core relationships that drive this full risk model. Um, So with the teams, you have clinical support people who are helping the doctors in the the back um, and not just taking vitals, but doing many, many more things. So we don't call them medical assistants, we call them care promoters. Um, We have people in the front whose job it is to make sure that the flow is going well. The last person you need to be managing the flow of anything in life is me. Or or people like me who love people, love helping people. I don't know. I mean, I'm going to be late to my own funeral. Everyone will know that. They won't be surprised. They'll be looking at the time and say, he's not here yet. You You know, so... So have people who are much more better equipped to can see better, you know, who can have all the tech there to manage that. Um, and then there's a lot of care coordination that's involved. 
um, with when you're dealing with a, such a complex population. Oftentimes, our patients need to see interventionalists, proceduralists. They go to the hospital. They need care in between going to the hospital, coming back from the hospital. Uh, so you need a team of people who help coordinate all of that care. And that's just at the center. Um, then there are people working behind the scenes. Well, and, and Fassel, don't forget, I mean, we generally have social work available in each market. Uh, they're not always in the center every day. Um, we have physician dispensing, so we can give patients the generic drugs that they're on. So 80% of the time, we can give them their medicines and not just a starter supply. We can actually supply them when they're coming in for their monthly visits. So it's always sort of drives you crazy when the patient wants to talk about the little yellow pill. It's a whole lot better if we can actually open the bottles and say, what, what, what little yellow pill are we talking about here? What are we doing there? Um, we offer cardiology uh, in our centers. We offer podiatry. We offer acupuncture. I mean, back pain is one of the leading causes of healthcare visits in the country. And acupuncture is one of the really good ways to help people with that. So offering acupuncture in the center. And then having the case managers that can be available to either do home visits during that transitional period of time or actually follow the patient into the hospital and make sure the PCP is getting feedback what's going on with the patient in the hospital so we can be in touch with the hospitalist. I mean, that that makes a, that it, it seems pretty common sense. Of course, the thing I think we all learn in healthcare is the, the problem with common sense is it ain't so common. So uh, it's really helpful to have all of that support around you to help you have that relationship with the patients. Yeah, it's, it's, it's health care. Now, I remember I had one of my first conversations with you, Fassel. You told me about the transition in your thinking and the transition in a patient's thinking. When a yeah. doctor joins ChenMed or a patient joins ChenMed, this whole transition into you don't have to be sick to see the doctor. And it was encapsulated in the question that I always used to ask my patients, why are you here today? How why can I here? help? And, the, and I can imagine you said that the first time that um, it happened with you, the patient said, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm used to, you know, outside there is a chief complaint. I mean, even the language, the language in fee-for-service has become transactional and it's quite harsh. You know, the patient presents with a chief complaint right. and the entire, rather than a concern, like, hey, what is your concern today? There's a very big difference between a complaint, like a nagging complaint. What is your nagging complaint today? And, and you know, the person could be, the person could be a heavy smoker on oxygen in and out of the emergency room with COPD exacerbations, but they came to me with a chief complaint of let's pick on back pain with the low back pain. So then I'm going to write document an entire visit. Okay, when did your back pain start? Where's your back pain? You know what makes it better? What makes it all? Do? And then until I'm done doing all of that and doing the exam, I'm done with the visit. You know, and I didn't get time. The thing that my primary concern though with the patient is like, oh my god, you know, this person's on you know on oxygen, still smoking, in and out of the emergency. I'm worried that one of these exacerbations is going to kill him. And, uh, but I don't have time. You know, I, I remember being outside and people telling me when I was at the health center, oh, you know, these patients were seen at the, at the health center and they still ended up in the emergency room. And I said, well, you know, the patient came with one complaint. The PCP had so much time to address the chief complaint and then that's it, they got to move on. So I'm not surprised. I mean, if you ask somebody outside, what could you do to prevent an emergency room visit? They're gonna look at you, <laughs> what I can do. I'm just trying to survive here. Uh, so it's a tremendous mindset shift, you know, my, but uh, I, um, I, my, I had a lot of influence from my parents. Definitely my parents continue to have a huge influence on me. My mom had a lot of the Indian influence with the, with the Indian remedies. You know, I remember when I became a doctor, she told me something that now I've made it even more. I've been very busy in clinic these last few months. And I remember that when I became a doctor, she said, remember, Good doctors prescribe medicines, but great doctors wean patients off of them. <laughs> she never liked taking medicines. Still to this day, I mean, we have to take the flu shot to her. I mean, if she wants to get, the, she's one of the, you know. And um, but that stuck with me. It's so funny the things that stick in your mind, you know, over the years. And 
uh, these last few months, I've gotten very busy in clinic, my, uh, having more clinic time. And so I re I'm reminded of that. I'm a little bit older now, and I uh, feel a little bit more bold about um, helping helping people eat better, make better choices with the options that they have. So we were we were we were actually pretty serious about the Walmart. You know, many of our patients. You know, it's funny we talk about Walmart and food. I had a presentation with a bunch of business students, and I I used the I was using Walmart for the Walmart grocery example with them. And the first comment that came from these students, these are brilliant minds from across the country. I was so inspired, impressed by, they knew they could quote articles so well, and they knew a food desert and this and that and all, it was amazing. But then when I talked about the healthy food options at Walmart, the first comment they, wait, wait, Walmart has grocery? <laughs> I love them I said, too. <laughs> I said, yes, they do. You know, they have healthy food, op a lot of healthy food options. And, and so that's a disconnect. You know, in Walmart, like 100, 150 million Americans are connected with the Walmart on a daily basis, daily basis. Right. That's a very different, that's a, there's a, you know, it's a very different America for the ones who are plugged into a Walmart on a daily basis. And then, so when we're talking about underserved people, underserved seniors, um, where do they get their groceries? Well, they get their groceries from places like Walmart and Aldi's. I don't know if you have an Aldi up there in, um, in Washington, but uh, so you have to learn where your patients do their grocery shopping and then help them live better, eat better. Because it's one thing, like Dr. we were talking about the diabetes, it's one thing to say, well, you know, no sugar, no sweet, no rice, no bread, no pasta, all the stuff we say, we got a list of things that we go through. And and then it's like, okay, I'm going to start you on this medicine. I'm going to see you back in six months. You know, we're going to do some blood work. And I pat myself on the back. Great doctor. I'm a great doctor. And then the patient's like, all the foods, the things that made me, <laughs> got me to where I am. He said, "Okay, what am I supposed to eat then?" Um, and uh, so then here I have the time to be able to coach them with healthier eating options. And with the with my laptop, I can just pull up. This is how much. It, well, how much does it cost? This is how much it costs. You know, for a dollar and a half, you can get this rice cauliflower, and it's ninety percent fewer carbohydrates than than rice, regular rice, and. Here's how you saute it. There's a YouTube video here, 30 seconds on how to saute the rice cauliflower. And you could use your same seasonings that you normally use, use whatever whatever you do. And and uh, it's a much healthier alternative compared to the whatever the rice and however you prepare your food. Because remember the other thing with our patient population, another huge fact is that 70% of our patients are minorities. So that's huge, it's huge. So you have to, it's not, you know, it's one thing to go through. If I went through and I said, no sugar, no sweet, no rice, no bread. I mean, that, you know, that's not, you have to be able to deliver culturally competent care too. Care that makes sense to whoever is in front of you. If it doesn't make sense, you know, then it's going to be, then they get confused. They get sick and then it's on me, you know. So I have an incentive here to connect with each person, give some very realistic, practical solutions, some alternatives. And uh, and then that's the beauty, you know, because then when you take the transaction out of the equation, you know, patient doesn't feel the copay, you know, the the doctor is not concerned. I don't, I don't, I don't. You're not worried about billing levels. I'm not a billing. I don't, you know, I don't even remember any any of that. I remember actually that was my biggest stress on my first day out of residency at my my. You know how long my orientation was at my community health center? Well, you're hey, you're 15 minutes late. Your rooms are full. <laughs> that's that's <your> exactly <laughs> it was the morning of the first day yep <laughs> and and i got and then i had to rush to the clinic i got to the clinic. i was really excited i had my my litman stethoscope with my name on it that my mother got me for finishing residency and i was very excited about and i got there and the manager said to me hey you're the new guy right and i said yeah 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 she said well you're late you got three <laughs> patients over there waiting for there you already you go. <laughs> and i said oh I, hate I don't being know. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's exactly what happened. I said, I don't know how to bill. That's what I told her. I said, I don't know how to bill. She said, Oh, that's okay. Just put 99213 for everything. And then, sure enough, guess who had like four or 500 charts shortly thereafter I had to fix because I was putting at 99213 for everything. It was a disaster. Well, I and now, to... well, hang on just a second. Now, now, two things. How long are your visit lengths at Chen Med? And do you have to worry about coding? And don't you have your own EMR too? I mean, <laughs> yeah. spill the beans. 
Yeah. So, so visits, visits over here on this side are monthly, 20 minute follow-ups, 40 minute new patient visits. And, um, and if you look at the EHRs outside, um, most of the EHRs that are out there aren't, they aren't relationship tools, right? There, it's not like a tool that you can see everybody who's touched every, you know, like the patient's interaction with the healthcare delivery system and all that. They're designed to to capture codes that you can bill and you can make it easy to refer, right? Um, as opposed to the EHR that you know the Chens had to develop on their own uh, internally, which isn't focused on billing, um, but it's more of a of a of a tool that it's for relationships, you know, it's a relationship, almost like a customer service sort of management tool. <laughs> like I want to know the phone calls the patient made that the touches made from team members to the patient, like pretty easily that I can click in a couple places and see the interactions between the patient and the healthcare delivery system. Uh, so that, so it's a different, it's a different system. You know, we're not, we're not focused on the documentation of the patient's medical, you know, you know, complexity, right? We're focused more, you know, for billing, it's more of a, a focus on the person uh, themselves, you know. So you're focused on keeping people healthy. You've got a full team of folks working with you. An EHR that doesn't focus on billing levels. You don't even have to remember billing codes. You see everybody once a month, whether they're sick or not. You get farther and farther, I would imagine, each visit into who they really are as a person, what their home life's like, the, 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 what, what's become known as the social determinants of health and all that stuff. And, and, and your company makes money. <laughs> you and, know, it's, and, uh, it's, and you guys are growing. I mean, how, how does this all work? Right. It's, it's, it's wild. It's a wild, it's wild that you can make money. How do you make money by improving health? Right. It sounds, it's such an ambiguous and well, you know, there's a lot of waste in American healthcare delivery. You know, waste has been well documented for a long time. Dr. Dana, we give, we give residency talks, uh, you know, about waste. And I remember when I joined the company, I immediately thought I was in orientation. Orientation, my orientation, remember the at community health center was the morning of the first day. At ChenMed was three weeks in Miami, you know, was my orientation. A heavy, heavy training. And um, I remember when we we're talking about waste and healthcare delivery, I immediately thought of waste as like, you know, the unnecessary specialty referrals over prescribing of brand name drugs over the generic. That's what I thought of as waste. But what I missed, what's driving the waste isn't that. I mean, those are definitely drivers of waste, but the main driver of waste is, you know, all the, like Dr. Dan was saying, all the unnecessary emergency room visits that then fuels all these unne unnecessary hospitalizations. So when primary care is delivered in all the wrong settings, you know, and it's inefficient, you make more money. So when the orthopedic surgeon, surgeon is doing a knee exam and doing a knee injection as a surgeon, the orthopedic surgeon can generate more RVUs or bill more for that than what the primary care doctor should be able to do in the primary care setting. Um, and the same thing goes with pneumonia treating something like pneumonia or any kind of what any illness like that that you could be treated in the primary care setting but if it's treated in in the emergency room setting you can bill a lot more you could bill ten thousand plus dollars for a pneumonia even if the insurance will end up paying six seven thousand dollars for that but they can bill you know ten twelve thousand dollars for a pneumonia that we could do in the outpatient setting for less than ten dollars easy easy um and so the, once you understand that, that the main driver of the waste is unnecessary hospitalizations fueled by unnecessary emergency room visits, then you got to be very, very clear with what that means to improve health. And we've sort of simplified it to three pillars. You know, so improving health is three things, which we all know, prevention and early intervention, right? You want to prevent problems from happening. And if you have a problem, you want to prevent the small problems from becoming big problems. So a patient who shows up unscheduled at one of our facilities, you know, with, you know what the term is when somebody shows up unscheduled in the fee-for-service world? Walk-in or work-in. Walk-in, and then followed by many eyes rolling. Oh, 
<laughs> as if I uh, didn't have enough to do today. <laughs> as if I didn't have enough to do today. Typically, a non-clinical front desk person, you know, timidly walks to the clinical space. Sheila's back. <laughs> I have a walk in and oh, you know, an inconvenience to my schedule. Uh, so, um, but in our world, we call them patients in need. So a front desk would have a patient in need of medical attention. Boom. Suddenly everybody, everybody remembers why they became doctors and nurses in the first place. And, um, and they go to help, uh, help that patient because you want to prevent small problems from becoming bigger ones. You know, that, then of course we, and, and with the prevention, it's not just offering a vaccine or, or helping people eat better, you know, to avoid getting sick. But it's that culture of prevention, right? Like, how do you respond to someone like, say, like my mother, you know, who is very skeptical of medical care uh, in general? Uh, she may be resistant or flippant to whatever recommendation you're making to her. But how do you respond to somebody who is resistant or flippant to whatever preventive measure? You know, you have to have that training to do well and prevent. Prevention is not just offering it and that's it. I mean, prevention is really true prevention. That's how you... You know, so you got to be, you had the culture of prevention, you got to have the early intervention. And then there's a third piece that is something that we don't like to talk about in America. I don't like talking about it either, but, but it's a fact of life. Most of what physicians, what we have done as physicians for, we've had 5,000 years of written history. We know for thousands of years, the primary function of doctors up until about 150 years ago was to aid in the transition from this life to the next. And so easing of suffering is another huge driver of health when someone when you can't prevent and you cannot treat you know how do you how do how do how are people treated at that stage of their lives you know right now eight to nine out of ten americans want to die we want to die in our own beds but that's not what happens most of us are going to have what's called an institutional death where you end up dying in a nursing home or in a, in a hospital connected with all these tubes and things and so how we approach the end of life, you know, that matters in our world as well, too, so that people can have a death with dignity and honor. You know, we mourn our patients. You know, we don't just get a notification like so-and-so deceased. <laughs> I remember this thing. Not even deceased. What's, what's the word, doctor? So-and-so expired. I'll never forget that. I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, I'll be getting a notification expired, you know, as opposed to my world I'm in right now. You know, I come to the center and everybody's in tears and I think, okay, tell me what happened. Oh, you know, that patient who loved your son and his wrestling and all that, you know, he, he tripped, fell, hit his head and he passed away. And then we all, we mourn together. You know, we take a moment out to mourn together. And, and in fact, actually that day that happened, it was just about a month ago. Uh, we're, we're in this talking about him. And then my phone rings and it's him calling me on my phone. I knew it wasn't him, but it was his daughter. And she said, are you at the clinic yet? I wanted, to, I wanted to call you before you heard it from anybody else. And she invited the whole center to his celebration of life. You know, that's what happens when you have this relationship-based, team-based model where, the, where even the interactions are not transactional in nature at all. You know, every single one of my patients has my cell phone number. You know, I mean, when if a patient calls me, you know, that is not a burden on me. And even when I'm with my children, and a patient calls, they they kind of look at me as like a superhero dad. Like, oh my God, look at the way he's helping helping that person. You know, it's not an inconvenience because I know if they're calling me, they really need to call me. Actually, the problem I used to have in the beginning was the patients wouldn't call me. And they'd wait till Monday. And I said, why wouldn't, why didn't you call me over the, and, oh, well, Dr. Sam, we know you got your kids and you're busy. We didn't want to bother you. I said, no, 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 you got to, please. Please, you know, only have a couple hundred patients. You know, it's very rare, you know, when you're dealing with something like that. It's an honor for me to be able to help you. That's why I became a doctor. So, so as I listen to this, and again, this isn't the first time you've told me these things, I'm still amazed at the fact that this kind of practice coexists with the fee-for-service rat race everywhere else in the country. Um, if you have the statistics in your head right now, what percentage of the American population is 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 being treated underneath this kind of full risk capitated payment mechanism? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so with Medicare right now, we're we make up this full risk model makes up less than five percent of Medicare today. And so it's one of those things Dr. Dan likes to say, you know, that it sounds simple, but it's not easy. Right. And so I remember when I was in orientation in Miami, I thought I was in the wrong orientation room. Because I was sitting over there and there were like 20, 30 people in this room and we're going, you know, and I'm hearing these computer science majors and electrical engineers, you know, business people are talking. I'm thinking, am I in the right place? You know, am I the only doctor here? You know, like, well, what, what, what kind of company did I join? And soon thereafter, I found out that about 10% of the, the, the workforce are IT people data analytics people so um and you know we've 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 met doctors who were were able to save even 40 years ago you know we're able to save 30 50 percent off of the total cost of care even before all this data analytics and technology you know so doctors know we know you know especially good primary care high quality primary care of course you restore the doctor patient relationship why would anybody go was medically complex to some some random person you know doesn't know who they are you know we know this we've known this for decades um but now it's you know we're much more i think part of our secret sauce is that we have this near real-time data analytics i wasn't i wasn't kidding earlier about ubering patients from the uh from the emergency room to the clinics it's one of my favorite things that that we do when a patient swipes their insurance card in the emergency room you know, we get a notification, it comes as an email, and then I get a, an alert on my on my phone that my patient is at the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I can catch that patient before the emergency room doctor even see while they're still waiting in the waiting room. And they'll tell me, oh, Dr. Syed, I was pushing, pushing this piano. I know I shouldn't have done it. And I hurt my elbow. And I said, okay, no problem. You know, why, why don't you go ahead and I'll send a, an Uber to come pick you up, come to the center. I'll have, I know the patient. I know what I got to do to I've got some, I've got an injection that'll knock out that pain and I've got something over here that'll help you with your elbow. And uh, we'll, we'll, you know, and I check away. Oh, they're about six minutes away. Great, Darcy. Thank you so much. And, uh, and it's wonderful. It's very fulfilling for us. I mean, so we're now we're using, you know, it's not high tech to use navigation on our phones. Right. It's not high tech to book a trip on our phones, you know, on a vac family vacation on a plane. It's not high tech to Uber somebody i mean i use it all the time for my parents aren't feeling well and it's late at night okay i'm going to have something i'm going to have something sent over to you from the pharmacy it's not a big deal you know i mean me and dr dan were poor dr dan were, wasn't feeling well sometime recently i remember we were in a meeting or something and i could hear it and he's very very particular about his uh you know how he feels you know he's always just he's an inspirational man ready put together like and i could tell that he felt a little bothered and i was able to quickly send over some medicine I don't know, yeah it was a tea like a, an herbal tea from tampa to richmond in the middle during that conversation you know while we were having our meeting i mean these aren't high-tech things in this world today um but it makes sense in our world because if the if care delivery is efficient if it's simple if it's easy we make money who makes money in this inefficient system you know the big the big thing that nobody wants to talk about is that you know, hospitals run 70 to 80 percent of all the outpatient facilities across the country. That's the big difference between now and 40 years ago. In the early 80s, the, the, the practices were run by doctors. But then in the 80s, the hospitals started buying up these practices. And now they got 70 to 80 percent of all these facilities. So, of course, if you make money by primary care being delivered by all the wrong people in all the wrong places, Where's the incentive? Of course, you know, oh, I just need you as a primary care. I need you to refill the medicines. I need you to do the referral renewals. And if you're lucky, you get to do wellness visits. Right. You know, I mean, it's a completely. So where's the incentive to let go of that? And the system we're talking about is a four point three, four and a half trillion dollar healthcare delivery. I mean, our system is a four. I mean, the numbers are so monopol. It's just a monopoly money like state right now where where we have to even, we have to put it into perspective when we meet with residents and young doctors that our, what we spend on healthcare is more than double that of the entire Russian economy.
Right. That's for their space program, their war machine, their entire infrastructure, their entire everything that makes up this massive world power, Russia. We spend more than double that on healthcare. So the ones who are benefiting from this, what makes any of us think that they're just going to give it to us? They're not just going to give it to us. We have to find ways to take it back from them. You know, so we got to work within the full risk model under the Medicare Advantage program where we have the control and the influence. Otherwise, and, nobody's going to give it to us. Right. And I keep I keep seeing that Venn diagram, those circles slipping together where where finally, again, good medicine is good business. And it's not sick care, it's health care, and it's real. How many employees do you have? We now have over 6,000 employees. So we've had some incredible growth. What's your when growth joined, rate? What's your projected growth rate for 24? Probably the same. I see the same trajectory as we've had for the last six years. When I joined, we were we had just crossed 1,000 employees in November 2017, which was a big deal. Um, and then in October last year, we had crossed 6,000 employees, which was just unbelievable, incredible growth. We were in four or five states when I joined. Now we're in... 15 plus, we may be in 16, but for sure 15, 15 states now. Um, really, it's it's a remarkable story. I mean, Chen Med was started almost 40 years ago in, in 1984 by the Chen family. Like you said, a, this is a family business. And uh, it's remarkable that um, that the family has been able to scale this thing in an independent manner. You know, this has been... This is amazing, but the, to to where we are now, you know, able to open centers, uh, but there's so much work that needs to be done. My God, there's right. so much work that needs to be done to get to where we are. It took a lot of work to get here, and it's a lot of work to scale. It's one thing when you have people, hey, I've been doing this for six years. I learned the art of, you know, but then to bring on new people, train them with those massive mindset shifts, you know, that need to happen, the art of influence. The art of earning trust. It's not. It's one thing to work on the patients, but you know, if you're three patients behind and you've got a staff and who are nervous about starting an IV, hey, I've got a patient who needs an IV. Well, in Tampa, you know, you get the IV. If you you go to the emergency room, you, know, you get an IV in the outpatient primary care clinic. They don't even do IVs in the urgent cares. So you, it requires earning trust of your page of your staff as well. You know the employees too. That hey, we can do this. Don't worry, we got this. Um, with, with whatever you're dealing with, it could be something needing an IV. It could be a CHF exacerbation. I've got a doctor right now who's got a CHF exacerbation at the at one of our clinics that he's seeing every day. Patient sending the patient back and forth home, diuresing the patient in the waiting room. <laughs> you know, because we have the. Uh, the diuretic available, which is quite remarkable. It's amazing. You know, that patient in most other in most other situations would be getting diarrhea, probably waiting 10 hours in the emergency room in that gurney, um, you know, getting the same medication, but at a much, much, much more cost. And by the way, how old is how old are the diuretics anyway? Like medicines like furosemide, it's not like a some brand new, amazing state-of-the-art medicine. I mean, it's like these are this is pretty bread and butter stuff. So what I'd like to do right now is just wrap for today. I think that's plenty of interesting conversation, especially if you're listening right now or watching us on video and you've not heard somebody talk about what it's like to be inside of a full risk primary care model. And if this sounds unbelievable or too good to be true, or you're cocking your head like a dog wondering if what you're hearing could possibly exist in this <laughs> world, I encourage you to do your due diligence. If you are if you are attracted to this kind of health care, I encourage you, whether you're looking to change your job or not, go interview at a Chen Med facility and you lift up the hood for yourself and see if you think that these statements are in any way outside of what's actually happening on the ground in one of their facilities. So we have a community, Burnout Proof MD community, where, where 40 or 50 folks and I have coaching every week. And I went and I presented our Burnout Proof uh, on live workshop to the Chen Med Partners Committee, a couple uh, partners meeting a couple of years ago. And I came back singing the praises of y'all 
and my community accused me of drinking the Kool-Aid. And, and here's here's what I could here's what I could say. I've been with you several times since then. We're having this conversation today, and I can tell everybody I am satisfied and have done my due diligence that this is a whole different way of practicing medicine. It's an island of sanity for a full service primary care doc like me to do the work you've always wanted to do. And I can tell you that Daddy Chen came over as a, as a primary care doc and had two boys that became primary care docs that are the CEO and CMO of the company. And I watched them stand in front of the partners and say, our goal is to transform healthcare in the United States of America. And everybody in the room believed it and they're all doing it. So if you're tempted at all to explore this, please do. Don't believe a word I say. Don't believe these two. <laughs> Go check it out for yourself. Go check it out for yourself and see if it's not a practice a style that you would want to get involved with. And by the way, I just want to make really clear. Nobody's paying me any money to say this. All <laughs> I know is that this is the kind of practice I always dreamed about when I decided to become a doctor and a family doc. The only, the only thing I ever wanted to be was the, like Dr. Schmidt, the guy who was my doctor growing up real Norman Rockwell kind of thing. It was in the lower floor of a house downtown. And <sighs> it, it, it was it was beautiful. And yet that wasn't something that was attainable back in the 90s in my fee-for-service practice. So Basil, Dr. Dan, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I'll give you just a second or two each. Is there anything else you want to say to our audience right now before we take a break for, for today? Well, no, I, I, yeah, I yeah. thank you, thank you for, uh, for the, for the call out about what we're doing. We are very passionate about it, and what I would say is, most of our centers, if a doctor is interested in taking a tour, they don't even have to interview for a job. If they want to come take a look, we'll make arrangements for that. Great. About once a month, we have a um, virtual happy hour that our uh, team puts on and we have three or four of our physician leaders on it and they can come and ask questions and kick the tires virtually if they want to as well. Uh, it's the, the doctors answer the questions that they're asked. We don't, we, we're not pulling any punches. We're not asking anybody to lie. So happy to engage with people however they would like to. Great. Yeah, I, we know that most doctors are experiencing some degree of burnout today. You know, we have a, there's a scary number of doctors who are nearing retirement, something like two out of five doctors are nearing retirement. We don't, out of a, you know, we have a million doctors for 330 million people, but not even 100,000 are family doctors, 97, 98,000 family doctors. So as a country, we're split 90, 10 the wrong way. So if you're a primary care doctor listening to us, and you're in that space where you've got to do what you've got to do for your kids, for your family, um, and you're just doing what you got to do till you can retire. You know, I just want you to know that there are models out there where you can get rewarded for keeping people healthy. You know, you've got the model like you heard with us with the full risk, full risk model, and there's also which I, I love too the direct primary care model. I think that's very exciting. You know, the growth of the direct primary care model for the people who that can work for. I think that's wonderful. Uh, but in the full risk model, you know, we make sure our patients eat well. You know, if they need warm clothes, we get them warm clothes. It's it's remarkable. My son, 15 year old, <laughs> uh, yeah, we provide transportation. My 15 year old volunteered for the first time at one of our clinics yesterday. And um, and it was a it was an eye opening experience for him because when he sees retired people, he sees people like my parents and their friends who are enjoying the best years of their lives with their grandchildren. But what he didn't know is that there's a huge population of people who aren't enjoying their golden years. You know, the golden years are anything but for them. And, um, and, and he, spent, uh, he spent the ending part of his day preparing food baskets, fruit baskets for people who can't afford to eat healthy fruit. And he said, Daddy, you know, food is medicine. And I said, yeah, Baba, food is medicine. And so a model like this exists. If you're interested to learn more, you know, you could visit our website, believe it or not, chenmed.com <laughs> was actually available. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So we have we have a blog there with plenty of articles and uh, for you to read to understand about the mindset shift that we were talking about. We have a, the monthly happy hour that Dr. Dan was talking about, where you can come even anonymously, just hear doctors shooting the breeze, hear doctors answering questions from people about really what it's like being a full risk doctor. Uh, Dr. Dan and I have a primary care podcast, which is focused on um, the mindset shift that's required to transition the country away from our hospital-based healthcare delivery system to one that's based on high quality primary care. So a model exists like that. You know, where you can you can do much, you can do well financially by improving health. You know, it's a it's is it a perfect model? We'll be the first ones to tell you no, it's not perfect, but it's definitely much more ethical than what exists today. So thank you so much for having us. And you know, we're just, I'm sure we're gonna be doing this more. <laughs> of course. Thank you, thank you, Fassel Dr. Dan. So Dyke Drummond here again at the home of the Happy MD in beautiful Seattle, Washington. That's been the latest of our Physicians on Purpose podcast. Until I see or hear you in the next edition, keep breathing and have a great rest of your day. Mm -hmm.